Hey everybody, Matt, Iron Trap Garage, and we are doing another Iron Trap uh, podcast slash video interview, whatever you want to call it. We are doing this little podcast, and pretty much the first person we thought of when we did this was my buddy Pete. Um, and we've done a few of them now. I think feel like we're now kind of got the process down. So now we're ready. <laughs> and coordinating our schedules has been a diff difficult. Yeah, road. retired guys are really hard to nail down. <laughs> they are busy. Yeah. So um, I know I, I gave you the questions ahead of time, so you're a little, uh, you always kind of know what you're getting yourself into. But um, if you can just give everybody, the first thing is, well, you already, I usually explain this to people, but you already know what an iron trap is. But we're going to reference that, of course. Um, what, if you can give us your, your name, and uh, what is your iron trap? What's the what's the thing that you're addicted to? Well, I feel like it's one of those cop shows. Hi, <laughs> I'm Pete, <laughs> and I'm an iron trap offender. <laughs> <laughs> now, I uh, this whole deal started when I was a kid. My dad was heavy into racing, and uh, I grew up with three older brothers and uh, and, and a younger brother and sister with six kids. And my older brothers were the car, the car guys. My brother John, who was about seven years older than me, uh, in, in 1954, my grandmother gave him a subscription to Hot Rod Magazine for Christmas. Cool. Of course, John would devour everything between the pages, you know, between the covers, and I ended up with the leftover magazines. Right, right. And I already knew this is, this is it. This is what I want to <laughs> do. And as time went on and his interest changed, uh, the subscription to Hot Rod got transferred into my name. Oh, and uh, so we basically were getting Hot Rod from, I think it was like March or April of 54 until I stopped it about seven, eight years ago because I didn't want to read about turbocharged Hondas and stuff. That was not my thing. Right. But I still have most of those issues, the ones that didn't get destroyed. Right. Uh, and... I just knew this is what I wanted to do, and but, but so what is it? What is your iron trap? What's the thing you're you're really specifically? Well, it was old race cars, which I still have one. Okay. I have my '32 coupe, and uh, but looking at those magazines, I fell in love with the hot rods. And uh. being a tall, skinny kid, even then, I knew I wouldn't fit in a chopped and channel Deuce coupe or a Deuce Roadster. <laughs> so you know. The only chopped car that I've ever owned, believe it or not, is this relic sitting behind us, and it's chopped three and a half inches, and I had to lower the seat so I could drive it. So you've been pretty much since your brother was doing the the, um, the magazines and stuff, you were addicted. Oh, yeah, I was addicted at instantly. Like six, seven years old, I already knew that this is it. I got I to gotta do this. And uh, my first car on the street was a 41 Chevy Coupe. Okay. Drove cool. that to high school. And I uh, went through things like the 57 Chevy craze mm -hmm. and uh, had a 64 Comet Caliente that was pretty Oh, pretty I didn't know you had that. That's cool. Yeah, my sister drove a 65 Caliente, four-speed, 289. I used to borrow it from her and go in Allentown and street race <laughs> and uh, showed people what bang shift meant. You said no. second gear and the rear would hit the floor. <laughs> you know, and it was her car, so I didn't care. But uh, so was it was your dad? I mean, with all this stuff, so young into it, what what did you come from a family of car guys or car people, or was your dad a hot rodder? Oh, uh, my dad was was well into it. Uh, his first truck uh, was a '32 pickup hmm. with that he painted purple, and it had twin chrome stacks on it. Nice. And fifty or more years later. I ran across that truck again, and a friend of mine, the name Butch, still owns it, but it's it's a now, it's not recognizable as my dad's first truck. Okay. No but uh, so he was he was doing it a little bit. Oh, back in the fifties, yeah, yeah, mid yeah. mid fifties. I think he sold that and bought the fifty six Pontiac station wagon new. Okay. And uh, uh, Did, well, my dad was in the racing crowd. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah, yeah I have a picture of him. Uh, sitting behind the wheel of the Bob Arndt number 94 or 95 at that time at Allentown Fairgrounds in 1947. Wow. I have that picture. That's and, uh, cool. Yeah. And, so, uh, so was he embracing the, the hot rodding and racing thing when you were younger or was he well, against it? 
he was against it. He <laughs> said, I don't ever want to see any of my kids in a race car because all my friends died in the race cars. Ah, yep. So in 1955, or no, I'm sorry, 1959, he built a racetrack on our farm. <laughs> you know, well, go-karts aren't dangerous. We'll, we'll race go-karts. Well, when he saw my one brother hit the fence and literally fly through the air and land on top of the engines, <laughs> you know, he kind of got the feeling that maybe this wasn't a good choice. So we were racing go-karts. I was 10 years old and I was Man. running go-karts and, and I was driving against some of the better guys from this area. Uh, modified drivers like Freddie Adam, Junior Notstein, you know, guys like that would show up at our farm on a Sunday when there was nothing going on and we'd be racing go-karts. Wow. And you know, I was a skinny little kid with a giant set between my legs and no brain to go with it. <laughs> I didn't know that you could get hurt. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we just, we had a great time. That's cool. Now was that farm, um, you know, I know a lot of your family is around this area. So was that the farm that's right over there? Right like here the on the corner when you turn to come in here. Wow. That was uh, Green Acres Farm and uh, it saw a lot of racing. In fact, if you, when you leave, you'll see the big building to the left. Yep. That's built on the site of where the racetrack was. Oh, that's cool. And uh, it was a banked clay track, and it was actually a, a horse training ring years ago. And my dad right. graded it, and laid in the clay, and we had good times. Oh, my gosh. And then as we got older, my brothers and their buddies started racing cars on there. And it was all fun and games until the one guy took his absolutely gorgeous 56 Oldsmobile and put it through the fence. Oof. Yeah, the fence, you, you bounced off the fence with go-karts. You drove through it with cars. I would think with a big car like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and my my dad had a, the 41 Chevy Coupe that I ended up driving. Mm -hmm. was my dad's. And my uncle from Kutztown, my Uncle Tommy, had a 41 Coupe. And one day, of course, my Uncle Tommy just got his out of the body shop, got it painted and everything. And my dad and him ended up on the racetrack <laughs> having fun. And Uncle Tommy kind of lost it coming off the fourth turn and put it into the fence. Oh, jeez. And it was fresh from the body shop. Like I said, new paint job and everything. And the car ended up uh, tore up on the right side. So he drove it over and put it at the end of the walk from our house. And when my aunt came down the walk, he said, to, ah, you don't have to walk around the car. Just get in the driver's side and slide over. He didn't want her to see that he wrecked the car, <laughs> you know, after having it oh all done. Oh, my God. And took it home and got her out of the car the same way. And the next day it was back in the body shop and fixed. And wow. <laughs> so that's kind of where my roots come from. Yeah. Right? So what was the, um, was there a particular time or thing that kind of was the switch, as we call it, the thing that made you go from messing around to, like we are nowadays that you know we, where you're you were hunting the stuff and and really got heavy into collecting and hunting. actually a real easy one to answer my wife and i got married we started out with nothing mm -hmm. and we always joke she thought i had money and i thought she had money and we were both <laughs> broke so we lived in a mobile home and uh, we stayed there and the first actual house we bought was just about a three quarters of a mile from here and it came with a three car two-story garage mm. and a big parking area behind the garage <laughs> well I now had a place to put things it didn't take long things started following me home things that I had seen over the years that I couldn't uh, I didn't know where to go with them right but was there was there there was there a time like you started seeing cars you went to the races was there something that made you like go from just like your daily driver was you know was modified to like you know i want to collect i want to have i want to hunt the stuff out was well there... that would have been about the same time so i'd say about 50 years ago i had a place to put stuff and i knew i wanted this stuff oh okay so you kind so, of you just I, didn't I, have the out the way to right i always had it know. in my head but i had nowhere to put it okay and uh, what was your what was like the first like your first score or thing that you chased or you know, neat car or parts that you, you know, you found back once you got the, a space to put it. I helped a guy do a little bit of work on a 41 Ford two-door sedan. Okay. When I was dating an, another girl. Okay. 
We know. won't tell Debbie. No, that. she knows. <laughs> and uh, I helped him work on it, and then he started having kids. They had kids, and they mm -hmm. lost interest. And he bought a house, and he moved the car up there and shoved it in the garage, and it was there another 10 years from when he first got it. And the one day I ran into him, and he said, come up and take a look at that Ford. I went up, and I looked at it, and yeah, I can handle this. I was with him at Hershey when Hershey was two rows of vendors in a grass field that should have been mowed, and it wasn't. So that you, you like, went with him for Hershey for the first time? Yeah. What yeah. Year, what, roughly what year was that? Well, that would have been around that I went to Hershey with him. The first time was probably around 66, 67. Okay. Then uh, I bought that 41 Ford, and I thought, boy, this is pretty neat. And the sad part is, since then, I've had 18 more of those 41 Fords. <laughs> Came a thing, I guess. Yeah, just, that's just 41s. We won't even get into the several hundred that I had. And I'm not, not talking drivers. Parts cars. Right, different you know, stuff you had. Donor part, cars, you know, cars and parts. But I wow. had lots. That's lots. crazy. And, that, so, so you started, that was kind of like your first car that you, you helped on, you wanted to buy it, and you were able to obtain it. What did you think about Hershey the first couple times you went. Wow, that's really big. <laughs> <laughs> and that was when it first was starting out, right? Yeah, there was, uh, well, the show was held inside the arena. Okay. And uh, it had plenty of room. And the uh, flea market was right outside. And it was, oh, I would say maybe 50, 60 vendors. Okay. You know, that's just guessing. When did it go crazy? Was it like the 70s when it started oh, getting yeah. like out of control? With Yeah, the... yeah. And uh, I mean, there was even a spring Hershey for a while. Oh, really? I didn't know that. It was that. held on the site of the old airport, which was the white field for quite Man, a few I, years. Man, I wish they would do a, a spring Hershey. That would be killer. Well, well, they tried it again after it moved from there over at the uh, uh, Penn National. Okay. At where it used to be a car racetrack. Yeah, where yeah. They held it over there for a year or two, but it just didn't take off. Not yeah. like fall. Right. Uh, but did that was that visiting Hershey? Did that help with the kind of like the the hook to to get you? Oh yeah, seeing all the parts. Well, and, another one of the cars that drove me crazy was this relic sitting behind us. When I was a kid, I'd visit my grandmother, mm -hmm. and I would see this car cruising around Allen. Oh. Or I'm sorry, around Kutztown. And it was all nice and done. And yeah, oh, oh yeah. I mean, I have pictures of it from then. Yeah, wow. And. Uh, I just fell in love with it, and all you could see was the driver was his arm hanging out the window, and I always called the car with the arm. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it, it appeared where I could see it. Mm -hmm. It was moved in garages all over Kutztown, and ended up sitting outside. And I watched it for years, and every time I inquired about it, nope, it's not for sale, it's not for sale. And then I got a tip one day that, hey, maybe you should stop and talked to Elton about that car. Right. And I went out, and I think we had talked about this at some point. He was digging for potatoes out in the field, and I drove my truck out there, and I asked him about the car. And I said, sell it to me. And he didn't say no. He said, let me think about it overnight. So I knew he'd be back in the field the next day. So being that Elton was a pretty good beer drinker. <laughs> I took a case of cold ones along because yep. I worked in the brewery. It didn't cost me much. Yep. And we worked, I took the case of cold ones along and we sat out in the field and talked it over and he sold me the car. Wow. And that was probably after, I don't know, 15 to 20 years of trying and I got it. Wow. And, uh, but you had a bunch of stuff in between there. Oh yeah. Uh, wow. Oh yeah. Was it, I mean, once you got that first 41 Ford, was it mainly Fords, or were you hunting other uh, Chevys, well, too, and stuff? I would buy something that appealed to me. Uh, okay. The Fords were what I knew the best, but I owned other things. I had a 46 six or 7 Pontiac Silver Street two-door sedan, a fastback. Yeah, okay. Pretty neat car. Yeah, they are. And, uh, well, it came and went, but I had that. I My first real Go to work car was a '48 Chevy Coupe. Okay, that's that a I good car too. Bought yeah. right in the neighborhood, and needed a head. The head was cracked, mm -hmm. so I put a new head on or another head. Right. And uh, you know, I wish those days would come back. I went to the local junkyard over to <laughs> Normie Krauss, and I told him, I said, hey, I found the, what I need out there. I need the head off of that 
that Chevy that's sitting out there. Well, he said, uh, I said, what do you want for it? He said, well, who's taking it off? I am. I said, I'll take it off. He goes, $25. Boy, missed those days. Yeah, I'll say. Brought the head in, cleaned it up, put it on, drove that for years. That was my go-to-work wow. car. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So with the, um, when did you start to amass a, a collection, if we will? So you, you said, you know, obviously you got your first house and you mm -hmm. guys had a garage and you started buying and selling and, and you know, whatever. Uh, but w when did you start to really, like, you wanted to curate or collect, you know? Oh, that was probably... Or what set you off for getting, going that avenue of the hobby? I started noticing the Ford Flathead speed equipment. Ah, okay. And, you know, in my case, I guess I have an aluminum trap. <laughs> I, I, I just, it was easier to carry because it was lightweight. And I started <laughs> carrying intakes home. And at one point, I probably had 25 or 30 different intakes, all moldable carb, no two yep. alike. Yep. I would always keep the best one if I bought a double and sell mm -hmm. the other one to finance the next one. And then... For some reason, I sold all of them. I had a lot of them that I don't have today. I had early Almquist and oh, all kinds of stuff. Really yeah. strange stuff. Wow. Uh, but, and, you, but the speed equipment started appealing to you. Yeah, the, the, it vin, did. the nostalgic sp speed equipment. And especially the flathead. Now, I do have other things that what, I dabbled in. But what year was that? What years roughly was that that you started collecting? About 85. So at that point, that was like in the height of the street rod. Pull the small block out, put it, or put yeah. a, pull the flathead oh, yeah. out. Yeah, the, the, the flathead stuff was so cheap, nobody wanted it. You know, I, I bought, when I built the 41 Ford, I was at Hershey, mm -hmm. and I was, I decided to build a flathead. I bought a fixed in PM7 high rise, and I almost choked when I asked the woman, What do you want for the intake? She said, I won't let it go for less than $35. <laughs> so I said, well, okay. I guess. Yeah, oh so God. I brought that home. Wow. And, uh, and again, I have pictures of that engine when it was all done. I set it in the car, and I, I didn't have the front end on yet, and I have them in my album. Right. Pictures of that engine with chrome 97s. I sent the intake out, and... To a friend of mine, Bert Stegmeyer, and had it polished. Oh, cool! And he was a great metal polisher. Uh, had that polished. I had the heads polished, mm. uh, and then I started detailing everything. And you know, it just got carried away. And like I said, I got I have good memories and good pictures of that. So, where people kind of like, I mean, in the '80s, you're starting to hunt this stuff. Were people kind of confused or like? Not make fun of you, but like confused when you're like asking around, you got any flathead speed parts? Or yeah, stuff. it's like, what are you going to do with that? Yeah, I said, yeah. I know, I just like to look at it. And then I say, I sold the collection okay. for some odd reason. I think the next day I thought that was dumb. Oh, so I started man. collecting again. Well, then it really got carried away. And then I started setting goals of what I wanted to find. Oh. Which is good and bad because, well, it, money wasn't really easy to come by. It never is, but... I had to have my priorities, and I think back at a intakes and and trick heads and stuff that I passed on, right? Because I knew I didn't have enough money to buy what I was really looking for. Uh, uh, I look back, the number of McCullough blower setups that we saw at Hershey, <laughs> it, you know, and any given Hershey, if you didn't see ten or twelve of those, you know, you weren't looking. Right. I remember a guy with a a set of Arden heads. He was using them to hold his tent down. <laughs> he had ropes hanging from his tent with a pair of Arden heads hanging on. Oh, God. And I, I said, I know I can't afford them, but what are you asking for the Arden heads? He goes, you know, I don't think I'm going to sell them now. I don't know what I've used to hold the tent down. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, Somebody probably eventually made him a crazy offer oh, and yeah. he took them, but... Well, yeah, we'll get into that later, too. And I, I learned to ask. Right. Because it's something that happened one time. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you want, I can get into that real quick. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I kept seeing this Frenzel blower. And it was a good friend of mine that had it. He lived down in Tennessee. 
or whatever, somewhere down there, Kentucky, who knows, doesn't okay. matter. Down south, yeah. Well, anyhow, he always had it at his space. And it was to draw you in. Yeah, you know, right. I only ever asked him one time if I said, you know, if you ever think about selling that, let me know. He said, well, he said, I don't think it will happen. And a couple of years later, I ran into him, I believe it, either Charlotte or possibly out at uh, Marion County, Indiana, one of the shows. And I said, Scott, where's the friend's L? Uh, said, Some guy walked up to me with a wad of cash and said, this is what I'll give you for it. And he said, I said, take it home. Yeah. Said, no. Yeah, he should yeah. have should have asked what the do not sell price was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have a picture of a Frenzel on my phone to this day. Wow. That yellow one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have that. I can't, I look at it and just go. Ugh. Getting into a little bit into your collection, um, you know, you obviously started getting into heavy into collecting speed equipment specifically, um, and racing parts and stuff like that. Would you? What's like your top three? What, what I would call key things in your collection. It doesn't have to be the most rare. It could be something that's sentimental. But what's like your top three things that you're that's in your collection of stuff that you that you really uh, enjoy? I'd say the number one piece is the fish intake. Okay, what's that? It's, it's a it was a prototype. I, first of all, I bought this thing at a local swap meet for cheap cheap money. Didn't know what it was. All I knew was a flathead aluminum intake. And when and, I picked it up and and. I know this story, so for anybody who remembers, we, we talk about if you see it at a swap meet and it's, you've never seen it before, buy, buy it, because I learned that from Pete. A lot of stuff, my life lessons, <laughs> I've learned from Pete, so go ahead. Well, I heard the thing hit the tarp. The guy like, yeah. didn't throw it, but he dropped it on Just the tarp. It, yeah. it thumped. I turn and I look, and there's this really strange-looking flathead intake. Right. Uh, so I went over, he gave me the price. I said, you know what, I'm not even going to argue. Just here's your money. Right. And as I pick it up, I turn around, and here's all my buddies that are into the same stuff as me. You know, Nick the Bandit. Oh, yeah. You know, just on and on and on. Jack Stein. <laughs> okay, We're yeah. All, they're all staring at this thing, and I, they said, what is it? I said, I don't know. I don't care. I bought it. All right. Many years went by, and I had it on display to draw your attention to my table yep. for my one it sign, one it old flathead speed equipment. Yeah. And I had a man offer me a ridiculous amount of money for it at that point. And I said, nah, I said, you don't know me and my passion for this stuff. You know, it's not for sale. So he asked me if I had a few minutes to spend with him. I said, sure. He sat down and explained the whole situation. Hmm. His father was a, an engineer for fish carburetor, fish, for J.R. Fish. Yeah, okay. And they had this idea to make a multiple carb intake for the flathead for fish carburetors and they de decided they'd put four fish carburetors on this intake and it's a wild design and they made the prototype and they cast it and it weighs a ton because it's a dense aluminum yeah and they evidently did some testing and decided it didn't produce anything better than a you know stuff that's already on the market right. so they Pitched the idea in. Yeah, they just canned it. Wow. And, and and not so much as a joke, but they gave it to the chief engineer. Okay. Well, it was in his garage for years, and when the son was explaining to me why he wanted it so bad, he said, uh, well, it got stolen. Ooh. And I said, whoa, I hope you didn't think I did that. No, no. He said, we know who did it. His brother sold it for scrap aluminum oh, to buy beer. That <laughs> beer money. And uh, the beer money intake. <laughs> he was just he was just thrilled to see that it didn't get melted down. Cool. You know, it cool. still existed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I had it, and he understood. And now that I knew that it was a fish intake, I went ahead and put four fish carburetors on it. And that starts you on the like it happens with a lot of us. That went you went down the rabbit hole of collecting oh, fish, yeah, carburetors and stuff well, to the point where. People knew I was searching this stuff out, and up at uh, the EARHS Museum is the nickel-plated paperweight that was on J.R. Fish's desk. It's, uh, it's, I guess it's SR1 or whatever he called it. It was his first model of the Fish carburetor. 
he had one nickel plated for on his desk and wow. friends of mine from New England were at a uh, an estate sale and it came up for it was for sale on the estate sale and they bought it and brought it to McCungie no kidding and handed it to me in an old crumbled up brown lunch bag they handed me this thing and they said here this is for you and I couldn't believe it here's this nickel fish carburetor with the explanation of what why it exists right well that's, that's up at the museum on display I, I think that's cool about the our hobby I hear that over and over again and we do it I've learned it from you and a lot of the other guys of like you keeping your friends in mind of when you're you're out hunting for stuff and I feel like everybody in this kind of hobby does that like think of a well, you know you pick things up because you know a guy's after it on a whim you know they didn't know that you would say oh, I don't really want that they they just picked it up and oh, knew, we did know. that with uh, Hillborn fuel injection for a flathead we were down in Charlotte Bob and I and one of our friends was a Hillborn freak and he was in bad health so we convinced him to walk the long distance to where it was and we had already up you know agreed on a price with the guy yeah and it was cheap and we took this man over there and said hey we think that it looked good in yours <laughs> he goes over there and the guy gives him the price because he saw it was us and he asked Bob Bob don't you want it no Pete don't you want it? no <laughs> I would have loved to have had it but it's no yeah 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 you know we set him up and Bob and I turned around and walked away and as we're walking away Bob says if he doesn't buy it in the next 10 seconds I'm going to go back and buy it <laughs> So he bought it, and all the way home, he had this on his lap. Just looking you know, at ten it. Ten hours coming up from Charlotte, he's playing with this Hillborn. That's cool. And uh, both Bob and I always said that was the best thing we ever did. That's cool. So, so the fish is number one. We jump right to number one. Do, do you have two uh, two more things that maybe are really interesting or special or rare that uh, you have in your in your collection? That oh, you... there definitely is. You know, I'm just trying to think what. I have that one intake that we haven't identified a, a uh, manufacturer at this point, and maybe someday somebody will know. It had let's see four different tops for it. Okay. It's got the like a two-piece intake. It, yeah. It's a two-piece intake, and you can change out the top. Okay. And I was after that thing for twenty-five years. And when I least expected it, the man rolled up next to me at Carlisle, and I was there for that one. <laughs> yeah, I know you were. And <laughs> I, I spot Pete didn't even see it, and I spotted the guy on the golf cart rolling past his face. I'm hanging out with Pete. I'm like about to get up and chase the guy down. He beelines right to Pete, and I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> and he he always said, you know, if it's ever for sale, you get first That's shot. That's so cool. And he said, well, today's the day, and he gave me the price, and it was right. He said, do you think I'll have any trouble selling this? this weekend I said no you won't at all because it's already sold <laughs> you know and I bought it and we had it on the table oh yeah that's that's a highlight and uh what's the um what's the one that's in the, the museum that you have that's like the or that, well, I a, guess those are 97 it's not an intake it's uh it's that's an Anderson Automotive it's an mm -hmm. AA intake that has changeable tops too right and I have it up there to display a carburetor that the guys from Kutztown made for the stock car. Okay. The rules said you could run a four barrel. It didn't say it had to be a factory four barrel. And they took two 97s, two 97s, and put them together back to back, and they made the linkage, and it works. And it's a four barrel. That's it's crazy. It's made out of two Stromberg 97s. So they like cut it and then like brazed it all together. Yeah. That's cool. And it works. That's cool. And, uh, yeah, they won a feature with that carburetor on a Y-Block Ford at uh, Evergreen Speedway okay. back in the Jimmy or the uh, Ed Spencer days of promoting Jimmy Spencer's dad. Okay. And they didn't pay Freddie for the feature win because he said the carburetor was illegal, and they said show us in the book where it says it has to be a factory <laughs> carburetor. And the big joke till the day Freddie passed away and the day Ed died. The big joke between them was, hey, when are you going to pay me for that feature win? Oh, my God. And uh, that's, so we, even though it was never run on a flathead, I put it on that Anderson intake for the museum. Was it, was there ever anything that, um, like, I know you've helped a lot of guys buy or find stuff that maybe you don't currently own or you didn't purchase, but you helped someone else purchase it. Was there any, like, crazy stuff that you were involved in finding 
that you know maybe somebody else bought or you were a part of when they pulled it out that's a you well, know quite a few times like my best friend Bob who is gone we traveled all over I mean just incredible the mileage we put on chasing this junk and we would spot things that the other guy oh, okay would yeah. like and you know he did it to me I did it to him I mm -hmm. tell him hey look what's over there on the table and whoa you know and he'd buy it and really oddball stuff uh, Scott Blowers, good grief. How many of those I found and turned, turned Bob on oh, to Oh, cool. And as you know, he had. Yeah. And uh, one time, uh, Bob wasn't into eBay or computers. He was from the older generation, even right. older than me. And I was following a blower intake, a Scott Blower intake for a flathead on eBay. And Bob, I called him, told him to come down. And of course, we were, what do they call it, sniped it right at yeah. the end. We threw the bid in and he got it. He was so excited about that. I would have loved to have had it. And this kind of ending to that whole story is, I now own that intake. Fast forward, yeah. Yeah, yeah when, when Bob passed away, Patty told me to come up and he had the two blower intakes. So one is for an eye towel, yep. the other's for a Scott. They are different. Yep. And Very cool. there was the two that he had left, but he had sold how many complete blower setups. And it's just like we're we're just caretakers of the stuff. Oh you know? yeah, so you it know, gets, like, gets passed between people. But there were yeah. so many really neat things that I saw over the years, but either I couldn't afford it, or it didn't quite fit my right. collection yeah, of what yeah. I wanted. Uh, I never got really crazy with the heads, but I did buy certain heads, like uh, you know, trying to can't even think of the name of that one set of racing heads that I have with the separate manifolds. Oh. oh my goodness! This is terrible. This is old age, folks. Nah, it sneaks nah, up nah. on you and kicks you in the head. So, uh, do you have any um, any stories about the the ones that got away and not and, and not women, but uh, but <laughs> the uh, <laughs> well, I could. But any parts that are you well, know, the well, ones that got away or something you couldn't afford or you just missed out on. The one thing I talked about already was that Frenzel. Oh, the Frenzel, of course. And. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was, well, the one that got away from me from years I ended up getting, I had to wait for the man to die, was that Morrison. Okay, the but Morrison, yeah, you did get, yeah. You I did. ended up getting that, and that one bothered me because I had it in my hands how many times. Yeah. I used to borrow it for some of my displays, but I always gave it back. Yeah, And uh, that one's cool, that's, that's definitely yeah. awesome. But well, there's, there's other things that... Like you, you couldn't afford or something, you you know, you... Yeah, well... I mean, I guess you covered some of it. You saw McCullough blowers and stuff and you... Yeah, just... like they were like stacked up like cordwood and <laughs> couldn't, couldn't buy them. Uh, Any cars that like you, you know, like uh, that were really cool but you couldn't afford them or had no place to store them? Oh, a lot of those. A lot of 34 Fords. Really? Uh, we had, you know, I've, I've been fortunate... I've been in possession of some Deuce three windows over the years yeah. and, and kept physic the one in the worst condition is the one I kept is the old stock car. Well, that I would say that's probably like, you know, as far as key items in your collection, can you tell us about the, about the, uh, the three window that you still, still own? Well, uh, I bought a 46 Mercury convertible in the middle of a woods on a rainy night. <laughs> the guy worked weird shifts and he okay. said, I'm here now. So Bob and I drove down and we went and looked at this and I went down the next day to pick it up and there was a younger guy there and he recognized Bob. It turned out that Bob worked with his father. Okay. And he says, why don't you guys come to the farm on the way home? So well, we went up to, to uh, their farm Yep. and got the tour, which is a story in itself. Yep. Yep. Okay. And the guy was a 32 Ford collector. And I said to him, any old race cars or anything? And uh, he said, yeah, there's one down in the woods in the, in the old, I don't know, was it coal Coal bin or something, coal yeah, bin. yeah. Went down and huh, here's a 32 Ford three-window coupe stock car, just the body and frame sitting there. And they had the back of the car chained to a, a banjo rear so they could move it around. <laughs> and I looked at that thing and I said, wow, you know, the doors opened and all this. And he said, yeah, my brother bought that as a parts car for his 
hot rod project. He wanted the garnish moldings and right. a few other things out of it. And he said he just threw the remains down here because he said my dad didn't want it sitting near his good 32 Fords. Oh, my God. So they shoved it down in the woods. Well, bottom line, I bought it that day, $450. Ah. Ah. And picked it up and uh, God. brought it home and put it out there in that shed where it now parks today. And I started collecting what I needed to put it together. And the, the key piece of the project came when my buddy Paul decided he didn't want the flathead, the 59 AB that was in his 37 Ford. Okay. He pulled it out and gave it to me. And yeah, it smokes a little now, but it's old enough to smoke. But we beat that thing. Uh, severely and still have fun with it what's the uh so what for anybody that's not familiar with the car what's the quick background on on the history of the, the car? car was built by a guy named ed reese in uh, willow grove pa 1952 it was built for the owner of the rambler dealership that this mm -hmm. guy worked at uh the owner said i want a stock car you know, out of my shop. Yep. But there wasn't anything in the Rambler uh, <laughs> stable that worked would work out. So he, Ed and his buddies were building this this Deuce three window in this Rambler dealership. And one night, a bunch of his friends came in and they're ragging him. Hey, you know, this is dumb. You're you're working in a in a Rambler dealership. Building a Ford-powered Ford, -powered Ford. <laughs> you know, you're a rebel. And he said, well, I guess I'm a Rambler rebel. And that got painted on the car. It's still there. It's still there. It's the original paint job on the car to this day with the Rambler rebel on the quarter panels. And Ed proceeded to roll the car a few times, and his wife pulled the plug on his racing career, hmm. uh, on uh, Ed Reese's career, because Ed drove it for the dealer. And... Uh, and then it was driven by other people throughout other the years. Other people throughout the years. Uh, Mose Moore drove it. and I mean, that's a legendary yeah. name in our area for, yeah. you know, for racing, and, uh, dirt racing. Yeah. Tony Voles took over the controls uh, and drove that from, I believe, sometime in 54 till he ended up buying the car and he drove it, used it until like 60, 61. Wow. And then he sold it and it was bought by a... A gentleman down near uh, New Hope. Oh, okay. And uh, his name escapes me right now. And he raced it all over the place as the other guys. I have pictures from a lot of tracks. And yeah, you said there's a photo of it with like an Olds in it at some point. Oh yeah, I have a picture of it with an Olds with a 303 Olds in it and sticking through the fence at Violin, New Jersey. <laughs> he went right through the fence. It's crazy this thing survived. It's actually not. I mean, I know you guys fix it up some, but like the the body portion of it is actually not in that. Oh yeah, the door's still open and closed, and and I tell you what, I owe E.J. Kowalski, you know, all the credit. Okay. I mean, he he's the guy that really I collected all the parts, and E.J. put it together. Put for it you. together, and within weeks. Wow. And I went out there. I was running trips back and forth. This is a 56-mile round trip to EJ shop. And some days I was making two round trips, taking parts <laughs> out. That he'd tell me, here's a list of what I need. I saw yeah. I, So I'd come home and dig around here and find it and take it out. And the first time I drove the car was at Lattimore Valley on the half mile uh, in a vintage show. Mm -hmm. And... I realized, I mean, we finished it up the night before. I had no tires and wheels to put on the car. So I called my buddy Paul and I said, hey, uh, and I knew the answer already as far as what right. I asked. So I said, are you driving the 37 anywhere this weekend? He goes, oh, no. He said, I got it apart. He said, can I borrow your tires and wheels? This is from a restored 37 Ford. <laughs> 616 wide whites I put on all four corners of the stock car. And ran it like that. I ran it on the dirt track, and I ran it. <laughs> and you've, I mean, that car in our area is legendary at all the, all the nostalgia, you know, race events. Because you, for years, you've been running the thing hard like it's meant to be. I guess. Well, yeah. I mean, hey, if there must use, and, and I, yeah, I, I broke the rules a lot in these Vinny shows when they tell you to run forty miles an hour. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> Oops. I always my excuse was always I don't have a speedometer in the car. I don't, I don't know. I felt but that's not the truth. I have one in a tack a tachometer cup real low on the steering <laughs> column. I can tell you how fast we're going. Oh my but, god. Uh, that's and funny. And I, and like the early you know, a lot of the early showdown uh events there's a you know, photos floating around of you just It's amazing. I just saw a photo on Facebook yesterday. Oh, wow. Okay. One that I didn't have that I never saw before. I saved it. Uh, and photographers from all over. Tom Metz took the best picture ever. Oh, okay. uh, one of the best, too. He took the one where I really got frisky and hung a right rear out real hard at Lattimore because I was the last car on the track. So uh, play I a little bit. Yeah. I'm going to play. And I purposely ha held out until last. And I figured if they're going to throw me out now for breaking the rules, <laughs> so what? <laughs> yeah. You know, I had my fun. And he has sold hundreds and hundreds of copies of that in a three foot by foot and a half high, like a panoramic shot. Right. With the car all the way over and the rooster tail coming off the oh, right rear. that's killer. Uh, I, yeah, and... Uh, Tom and I have become good friends because yeah, yeah. of that picture. Right. And the last, the other picture that stands out as far as that goes was uh, we ran Lincoln Speedway. Again, we could run hard if we wanted, but mm -hmm. with, you know, a little care. So I'm third in line coming down into the first turn, coming down the front stretch. And two of my friends who I trust tremendously, uh, Ryan P. McWilliams, RPM. Mm-hmm was out front and the Polish hammer John Boric mm -hmm. was running second and I'm running third and I knew I could go around him so I jumped to the outside and the same time I jumped out so did Big John the hammer came out the same time I'm not lifting and we did what is commonly known as a dumb move I stayed high on the second turn at Lincoln which you don't do and I know this from experience we went three <laughs> wide through Lincoln at speed. And I got a call or a message from the photographer that took the picture. It was one of those, this is something that you dream of. Yeah. And he got it. Nice. And it was the three of us. And we're three wide at speed through Lincoln. And it looks like we're parked there and posing for it. That's cool. But I have a video and pictures that lead up to that pass. Right, right. That's crazy. You know, when I, I went in third, came out of it second came out of the fourth turn in the front <laughs> yeah well that's cool we had fun yeah so is there a um is there like a north star item is there something that like you never have been able to find or something even if it's totally ridiculous is there one or two things that are like would be the dream to find i mean as far as i'm concerned between you and bob you guys found Basically everything cool there is to find just well, about. <laughs> you know, it would lead back to a complete running, ready to go Arden okay. setup. You know, the dream, yeah. the Arden, uh, with the, the the big Scott blower, mm -hmm. you know, maybe even Hillborn injection on top. <sighs> yeah. You know. I mean But find like an engine like Yeah, ready to drop in that yeah. I could come home Friday and have it out the door uh, Saturday. <laughs> you know. And I got close. Yeah. Well, I got close. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, it yeah, didn't I mean, work out. But uh, yeah, and then that the Frenzel, of course, you know, because Frenzel. And then you know there was something that none of us knew about, and maybe I can embarrass you a little bit. But uh, <laughs> I was with Matt when he bought the the first Marshman supercharger, and I was <laughs> I, I wasn't you know I was envious. Jealous is not it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I strive yeah. to just know somebody that has this neat stuff, and I was really, I was really. We didn't know envious. what it, we, we didn't, didn't know, know what it was. Yeah, we didn't know. I don't know if I remember if it, we even knew it was there. I think I was going there for the yeah. Hillborn. The Hillborns were there. We knew about that and a few other things. Yeah, you know, and uh, this thing like is there. Yeah, and uh, it followed them home, and then the. The questions have been going, and they still are to this day. Like I told you last night, I found more information. Yep. Uh, we're tracking down the history of this Marshman supercharger, and, you know, it's a long story, but it ends up Matt finds 
two more, or they found him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they and, just find you. Yeah. And then I had Matt here a few weeks ago to give me a little bit of help on a project I had that involved more muscle than brains. <laughs> yep. Because I don't have either anymore. And uh, in the middle of the day, he's like, oh, I, that's right, I got something for you. I brought something along for you. And he comes walking over from the car carrying the first Marshman supercharger that we drug home. And he says, here, I brought this for you. I said, you don't have to do this. <laughs> yeah, but I want to. And it's well, like, you've done it. You've done it so many times to me, where I just mentioned something, and all of a sudden, a week later, it, it's on the tailgate of the truck. Well, so. I happen to know that you know I'm a realist. I know that, as the one young guy said, "What does it feel like to be in the fourth quarter of your life?" <laughs> and you know what? It wasn't meant to be a smart aleck question. That was just so how he looked at it because he was like 23 years old. But I think I think it's it's that same idea that this hobby even though we all collect seriously, a lot of us are, you know, I feel like are thoughtful. I've learned that through this hobby in the past 10 or 15 years that a lot of guys are like that. Like, I got three of them. You have a, an insane collection. I want to round your collection out. It's, yeah. not, it's not about what the money or the whatever. Yeah, I cause, think, you know, Because yeah. I think the same thing would happen for you if I, need, if I wanted something and you gave me, like there's one set of heads, I got the intake and they're wall hangers, but... You know, well, I like I said, hey, these these heads got to go with that intake here. So it, I, I think that's a cool thing with this hobby is that a lot of people think with collecting, some people are some people are super competitive and secretive and, you know, vindictive. But like I think a lot of people are cool like that. That's like you know. You know. Well, thank you, Pete. I appreciate you sitting down with us and having telling some stories and. Yeah, I was going to tell you, you can cut this short because we could go for days. Well, I know, I know, we can, <laughs> but I think it's cool to to get a little insight from everybody on their background and some of these stories. And I heard some stuff I hadn't heard before. So. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. I, I thought I heard all of them. So. Uh, cool. yeah, there's a lot left. You got to <laughs> pry them loose. Well, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate being able to do this. You know. Yeah. help you guys out yes. and i and i said to debbie i said i don't feel bad third in line between behind matt and mike i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right there all right oh, thank you.